Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And today we're talking about underwear. Lingerie, boxers, briefs, skivvies, pants, bras, over-the-shoulder boulder holders. You may know underwear by many different names today because certainly there are a number of terms that we use. But what do we know about the history? When we look at the famous portraits of the past and we see people dressed elaborately in all of their finery, do we ever wonder what they're wearing underneath? And if we do, how might we go about finding out? What techniques might be useful to us? Unfortunately, sparing just a few examples, items that are made of historical fabric are quite rare to survive. So we don't have very many examples of the materials themselves to speak to. So what can we look at? Well, we do have some images and we also have textual resources that we can research from. On top of that, Experimental archaeology has proved for many to be invaluable. By making these clothes and then wearing them and performing tasks in them, we can learn a lot about them. We can take it from image and text to physicality. With that being said, however, there are still gaps. These questions and the answers that come to them are open to interpretation. While we may not be able to provide definitive statements such as everyone wore so-and-so in such a way between such and such a date, what we can do is provide evidence-based interpretation of the way that clothing was worn by some, if not many, people in the past. And certainly, that is what I intend to do today. The undershirt, shift, chemise or smock, no doubt other names are also in use. This was the go-to foundational garment for many centuries worn by both men and women. The length and style of the undershirt differed according to the time period, particularly regarding the cut of garments that the undershirt was intended to be worn beneath. The gender of the wearer also changed the length, as did their social class. The material used to form this garment may be very basic hemp for the least affluent in society. More common is thought to be linen, which could be of increasing fineness depending on wealth. It could even be made of silk. The undershirt ranged from floor length to what we might now view as a standard shirt length. Sleeve length appears to have been equally variable. Some appear to have almost spaghetti straps, while others would reach wrist length. Necklines might be V-shaped, round, square, or even high-necked. The undershirt could be plain or it could be decorated. For an example of this, we need look no further than the 16th century to the ornately embroidered blackwork that could be found around the cuffs and necklines of the undergarments of the very wealthy. Some were even decorated with ruffles at collars and cuffs. It is often suggested that these smaller ruffles were the inspiration for the ever-growing starched linen and lace ruffs of the late 16th and 17th centuries. The smaller ruffles were a feature on undergarments before, during and after the ascendancy of the ruff in fashion. Principally, the undershirt functioned to protect the outer garments from the dirt of the body. These undergarments were the washable bit. Outer garments may be made of unwashable materials, or a person may not have multiple sets of outer garments, making it impractical to wash them often or, in fact, at all. Additionally, in a humoral medicine context, and I have made a video on the four humours which I will be leaving linked in a card, linen was perceived to be a healthy choice for somebody to wear next to their skin. Linen could draw out and absorb any malodorous secretions. In short, it could deal with any BO issues you may be having, without you needing to rely on frequent and, as it was seen at the time, medically dangerous bathing. Let's move a little further south to look at the braids. I think the closest modern reference or comparison for these items might be boxer shorts. As with the undershirt, it is believed that linen was the fabric that was most commonly used to make braids. 
they would be worn by men under their clothing, presumably, although not necessarily, in conjunction with an undershirt. It's worth also noting that not every man would have worn braids all the time, or indeed at all. Men may have used their undershirt instead of braids, particularly when male attire began to include breeches as part of outerwear. It is thought that they may have tucked the excess length of their undershirt in between their legs to perform a similar function as braids would have done, protecting the clothes from the sweat and stink of the body. While we are in this general bodily vicinity, it feels like an apt time to bring up the codpiece. And when I say codpiece, no doubt this is what springs to mind. Despite appearances, the highly padded and ornamented codpiece that Henry VIII famously sported does not function as underwear, or indeed as a holder for the genitalia. Without wishing to be too graphic, if a gentleman were to spend all day in the state of tumescence required to fulfil the requirements of the codpiece, I fear he would be rather uncomfortable, and frankly, possibly unconscious. In truth, the codpiece functioned in much the same way as a fly would on a modern pair of trousers while also possibly satisfying the desire to brag about yourself in a similar way that sports car ownership seems to today. We think that the codpiece probably originated out of the flap that was a feature in some earlier medieval hose or hosen, of which I will be talking more in a moment. In short, it's there to make going to the toilet a little bit easier. However, I have also heard it suggested that there have been some examples of codpieces found which appear to have a space to store valuables, much like a wallet. Now let's move on to hose, hosen or stockings. Originally, these are more frequently items that are thought to have been worn by men, but of course they were not only worn by men. They are very similar to modern tights, stockings or socks. Some early examples may have come with soles attached so that they could have been worn as shoes. They may have come as a one-piece garment so two coverings for the legs and feet that were joined around the lower torso. At this join, there was perhaps a flap that would offer the same function as a fly, which I did mention when talking about the codpiece. Or perhaps they came with a split opening at the crotch. They may also have come as separates, which would have been particularly useful if an individual wanted to wear different colours on each leg. They could be held up with garters or laced and tied to a doublet with points. We think that the ladies' version, when they were worn, may well have been shorter, perhaps reaching to just below or even just over the knee and tied with a garter. The reason that the male version was longer is mostly due, we think, to the fashion at certain points of history of men displaying some or all of the length of their leg. Hose, hosen and stockings were available in a variety of colours and also materials. Wool and silk are believed to have been the materials that were most commonly deployed to create these garments, as might be expected. Very fine, soft wool and silk were reserved for the most privileged in society. In many periods of history, ladies would also be reliant on petticoats or underskirts. These would be worn over their undershirt or chemise to cover the lower half of the body. They would be worn for warmth, and or to add layers and bulk beneath an overskirt. They might be made of wool, linen, cotton, taffeta and silk, all of which have been used at one time or another to create these garments. There was a particular resurgence in their use for fashion in the mid-20th century, and of course they are still being worn today. From the 1600s, women could use an opening or openings that would be sewn into the side seams of their petticoats to reach their pockets. And thus, I think it's about time that we seamlessly transition into our discussion of pockets. The pocket or pockets would be sewn to a band so they could be tied around a woman's waist, beneath her petticoats, skirts and other outer garments. By being placed under clothing, it was thought that this gave the pockets an added layer of security from would-be pickpockets. They may have been used to hold money, cosmetic items for grooming or even snacks. The pocket or pocket should not be confused with a pouch or purse, which was worn over clothing by both men and women by attaching it to a belt. Let's travel north to discuss breast bands or breast bags. 
Prior to the use of stays or bodies, on which more next, many women seem to have made do with wearing just their undershirt or chemise. However, others may have engaged in a kind of breast binding, using something known as breast bands or breast bags. In 2008, there was an incredible discovery of items from the 1400s, some of which look amazingly like modern bras. At Lengberg Castle in Austria, during a period of renovation, a stash of waste was found beneath the floorboards of the second floor of the castle. It is believed that this stash of waste was put there during a building project of the 1400s. Because of this placement and the dry conditions that were found there, the wood, leather and textile items within this stash of waste were extremely well preserved. Among all these items were found four fragments of linen that appeared to resemble modern bras. An additional find was some linen underpants. While, at least as far as I'm concerned, the former item must have been intended for the female form. The latter is potentially more questionable. So what do you think? Do you think that these underpants were intended to be worn by a man or a woman? Let me know in the comments section. We're going to stay with items designed to be worn on the torso and move next to looking at an item that has been known by various names. Stays, bodies, a pair of bodies or a corset. What we are looking at today is the precursor of the modern corset or shapewear, the Spanx of the day, if you will. The earlier version may have been made from linen, cotton, wool or silk, and would have been boned using whalebone, willow or even reeds. To make the garment more rigid, a woman may insert a busk down the front of her stays, and many of these survive. In fact, there are a number of carved wooden examples, which frequently seem to have been gifted as love tokens from a suitor or husband to his lady or wife. And perhaps this is unsurprising, considering the intimacy of the intended placement of the object. With or without a busk, the stays held the torso in an upright posture, but also helped to support and spread the weight of heavy gowns and skirts, preventing them from cutting into the skin. However, the deforming tight lacing that is connected in many modern minds, certainly, to this undergarment was only possible from the 19th century. In order to stop the laces from ripping through the fabric while being tightened to this extreme degree, it would be necessary to wait for the introduction of the metal eyelet. We should also remember that those who engaged in waist training and tight lacing, perhaps then as now, numbered in the few rather than the many. It was uncomfortable, impractical, and also caused the body to deform. This is not the sort of thing that everybody is going to want or even be able to do. It was a very, very small number. And although we talk about it a lot, that doesn't mean it happened a lot. Long before the invention of the metal eyelet, which made waist training and tight lacing possible, these garments, we think, played a vital role in celebration. Some dance historians suggest that during La Volta, which was a scandalous dance and a favourite of Elizabeth I, the stability of a woman's stays may have enabled more gravity-defying lifts to take place. Perhaps this very special grip or hold is what we are seeing taking place in this painting. Something else may have drawn your attention in this painting of La Volta, and indeed, other portraits that we've looked at on this channel. Namely, there seems to be something odd going on with this woman's lower half. Her hips seem to be unusually large, and there are a number of garments that could have created this silhouette or appearance, which we're going to be looking at now. First up, the bum roll or bum pad. This was a padded cushion that may have been filled with any number of fillings. Wood shavings, wool, horse hair or straw have all been suggested. The bum roll or bum pad came in a variety of shapes and sizes, depending on the fashion requirements of the clothing that was intended to go over them. In particular, which silhouette was deemed most desirable at the particular time. The bum roll or bum pad would be tied around the waist on top of the stays. As I mentioned previously, one of the functions of the stays is to spread the weight out. 
if you are wearing a bum roll or a bum pad without stays, then that tying function that then bears the weight of the skirts could become very heavy and painful. In fact, could cut into the skin, causing injury. The purpose of these items was to increase the size of the bottom and or the hips, which in turn will make the waist look smaller. A farthingale may also have been deployed. This shapewear item might have been worn on its own. Alternatively, it may have been used in conjunction with a bum roll or bum pad. The Spanish farthingale was a hooped underskirt that gave shape to the overskirts. We think that these hoops may have been formed or stiffened using willow, rope or whalebone. Centuries later, the Victorian crinoline would operate in a similar fashion. However, as time went on with the crinoline, it would expand to sizes that were never attempted and perhaps weren't even possible in the case of the farthingale. Another form of the farthingale was known as the French wheel, grate or drum farthingale. This farthingale does much the same thing as the hooped underskirt we were just discussing, in that it creates a foundation for outer garments, albeit in this case clearly the intention is to create a significantly different silhouette. Later inventions that were intended to reshape the female form are located in the pannier hoops. These were used to create projection coming out of the hips alone. Eventually, these items would become the vital scaffolding for the highly inconvenient but terribly fashionable court uniform of the Georgian Mantua gown. Unsurprisingly, if you look at this item, skill and practice were required to stand, walk, dance and get through doorways while dressed like this. Being able to wear it elegantly was a mark of your social status, your class, your breeding, and your education. They were a courtly affectation. Last but by no means least, let's look at a later addition to this form, known as the bustle. The bustle was intended to create projection from the rear, and the form it took depended very much on the desired size of that projection. If a small projection was all that was needed, then the bustle could have taken the form of little more than a bum pad. If, however, the wearer wished to make more of a statement, to have a larger projection, then that bustle would most likely need to take the form of a hooped frame. I'm aware that I cannot close out this video without discussing knickers, bloomers and drawers, but it's a tricksy topic because the point at which women started to wear coverings on their lower halves specifically intended to cover their genitalia is hotly debated. Some will state absolutely assuredly and fervently that before the 18th century, every woman went commando at all times. Others, however, will counter this using examples of Eleanor of Toledo, who is said to have owned a pair of drawers in 1561. Later, Maria de' Medici, who apparently had many pairs of underwear made for her some 50 years later. A big issue for me in the argument that women went commando at all times is I wonder what happened when they were menstruating. We believe that many women would have used rags as a feminine hygiene product. And if this is the case, how on earth would they have been held in place without some form of underwear? If we think back, to the Lengberg Castle underpants. Might this, in your mind, challenge those claims about there being no ladies' underwear until the 18th century? When I look at this example and I think about that question of menstruation and how you might hold menstrual rags in place, I certainly think that these would have been suitable for that purpose. Equally, they might well have been worn by a woman at any other time. Nevertheless, Examples of women in knickers shown in medieval and early modern text and images do not have a positive connotation. Rather, in certain instances, the woman in knickers appears to be allegorical for a disruption to the natural order, while on other occasions the garment itself seems to hint at the perceived promiscuity of the wearer. As Beatrix Nutz explains, quote, in his Costumes of Different Nations of 1594, Pietro Bertelli 
only shows the Venetian courtesan wearing drawers, end quote. I would argue that a connection between the notion of a medieval woman wearing knickers and promiscuity and chastity is equally bound up in the modern mindset. And that is because I think that when many of us think about medieval ladies' knickers, it's entirely possible that our mind might instantly jump to the chastity belt. This terrifying metal contraption, we are told, was fitted with a lock and the key would be taken away in order to ensure the continued virtue of an unattended woman. Perhaps she had been left behind when her husband went off to war. However, it is highly unlikely, and I would say virtually impossible, that these items were ever worn, and certainly not in the way described. In fact, I would argue that if, and it's a very big if, this item were ever deployed in this way, the first time would have been the last time. The thought of a woman being locked into this object by her husband, who then takes away the key and goes off to war, leaving her trapped in it for days, weeks and months, just doesn't make any sense. How on earth would she have been able to conform to even the most basic hygiene practices while locked into this thing? If she could, then it definitely wouldn't have been easy, and presumably she would have missed spots. Also. Wearing an unforgiving metal object for days, weeks and months with no chance of escape would have caused damage. And it definitely would have caused damage to the skin of her most delicate areas. It is my belief that any woman who was convinced, coerced or forced into wearing an item like this for any prolonged period of time would have risked injury, infection, disfigurement and in the worst case, death. I don't believe that the chastity belts were ever actually used. But if on the off chance they were, then I think it would have been incredibly rare and for far shorter periods of time than has been previously suggested. I believe the chastity belt has more in common with the torture implements that I discussed in my video on the history of torture, which I'll leave linked in a card. Namely, that they were for show perhaps for comedy value, perhaps to offer a sense of threat and foreboding. But I don't believe they were ever actually used. But what do you think? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversation in the comments section underneath the video. Or you can come and find me over on my social media. I'll leave links to my Instagram and Twitter in the description box. You can follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to the channel. And while you're there, hit the notification bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.